Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to worship this morning. I invite you to find a seat. And for those of you who are joining us, um, I feel like I'm a little loud right now. Am I a little hot right now? Well, I'm hot on the mic right now. Good morning to those of you who are joining us from your home worship spaces. We are glad you're with us. And if it is part of your tradition to light a candle with us when we begin our worship, I invite you to find a candle and something to light it with. Good morning, Titus. Good to have you with us this morning. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a hymn in the, in the hymn book about uh, this Sunday that's called something like the whirling, chanting, dizzy crowd or something like that. And that's what I feel like this morning. There's so much excitement, so much energy, the whirling, chanting, dizzy crown, crowd. This is the crowd that gathered to come from the Mount of Olives with Jesus down into Jerusalem. And uh, it, is, it feels like that. It feels like that energy in the place today as we come to commemorate that, um, that processional. So I invite you, though, to, um, from where you're sitting, if there's a pad at the end of your row, that's, uh, we use that to... Um, Keep track of who's here and, and uh, addresses and email addresses. If you'd like to receive the newsletter and you're not yet, please make sure your email address is there and pass it on down and take note, please, of who's with you in the aisle, or the, not in the aisle, in the pew, uh, who's worshiping with you. Be mindful of one another as we are here gathered together. Let us quiet our hearts as we join, join in prayer. God of all love and light, fill our hearts this day, we pray. Fill our church this day, we pray, with a deep sense of your presence, a deep sense of your grace, and your love. Amen. Good morning. I'm Kate morning. Winter, and I am honored to be serving as lay leader this morning. We begin with the story, which is found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, from the New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> when they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the, God, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he returned 
When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Please stand in body or spirit as we sing hymn number 197, Hosanna, loud hosannas, verses one and three. I invite you to please be seated and uh, children and youth to be up here with me to be up here with me can you guys come on over this way and um, I don't know if some of you made your way back out of no up here up here up here up here up here just for a moment up here just here for a moment just for a moment you can sit on the floor if you would like to but uh, just right up here right here right here right here right here thank you for being part of our memory our commemoration of this processional you brought in some of you brought in branches to add to our carpet of branches up here as we remember that that's how those first people in the parade did this they came before jesus and they they cut off branches from the trees and put them down to create a carpet along with their coats and i want to point out a couple things this, uh, for example, is a collection of different kinds of branches. This right here, for example, is, anyone know? Do we have any plant specialists? Yes. It's what? It, it is kind of a pine tree, kind of. It is evergreen. Anybody? Anybody? It's juniper. You can tell from the little berry right here, juniper. And in the Bible, juniper was the symbol of protection and faith. So maybe they threw juniper. It's one of the trees that was local to the region. Maybe they threw juniper in the way as we did. This is, some of you brought in these types of things, like these types of branches. What is this? Yes, what is this? This is pine. Pine was also there at the time of Jesus, and pine represented life, represented hope. So they threw pine branches on the road. And then this is something that's kind of fun. This right here, any idea what this is? What do you think this is? It's a what? It's a leaf tree. Any idea what kind? When I put these onto the carpet on Saturday, you could smell it. It got a little curly though, right? Um, since Saturday, you could really smell it. These are branches from a lemon tree. These are branches from a lemon tree, which also would have been there, lemon trees. And um, this is a particular lemon tree that my friend Beverly has in her hoop house, which is like a greenhouse, except it's a little bit longer. It has this plastic that goes over it and she can grow a lemon tree in Tipton, Michigan through this hoop house. And I want you to guess how many lemons came off this one lemon tree this year. Really, she harvested January, February. Guess how many? 10, how many do you think? 15, how many do you think? 52, how many do you think? 5,000, a little bit less. How many, anybody, anybody other guesses? 200. 
200 lemons came off this one tree in her hoop house. And you know what she did? She sold them at the farmer's market. Isn't that so cool? How many lemon trees, how many lemons do you think are going to come off this branch? What do you think? Off this branch right now, how many lemons are going to come off this branch? How many? How come none, Henry? It's a good chance it's dead. It's not connected to the tree anymore. There are not going to be any lemons that come off of this branch anymore. And you know what? Jesus was out in the vineyard with his followers, and he talked about this. He pointed to the branches on a vine, and he said, I am the vine, like I am the tree, and you are the branches. Stay connected to me, and you will be healthy, and you will be fruitful, but when you get disconnected from me, you won't bear any fruit, right? So he used that as a way of talking to his followers, and his followers later became members of a church. They later became people of the way of Jesus. And when you keep this in mind, I am the vine, Jesus said, you are the branches. As a church, when we stay connected to Jesus as a church, what kind of life do you think we will live? What kind of way do you think we will be to each other? You all in your hands hold the answers that Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. If you stay connected to Jesus, you will live this way in love. And so I would like for you guys to share with all of us what you have, what you have um, in front of you. So could you do that for us, please? The, the reading from Romans. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Never stop praying. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. But take thought for who, what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, you guys. And as you go off to your classes, you'll talk more about this. Donna. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of grace, you call us to follow you and your way, but other ways are seductive, and so we come here to be strengthened. God of vision, you hold before us an alternative way of life, different priorities, different loyalties, different values, and we know that there are other ways too ways that are tempting, manipulative, and powerful. 
and we are drawn to following those priorities, accepting those values, showing loyalty to those powers and practices. God who blesses the meek, the peacemakers, and the merciful, forgive us when we lose sight of you and your way, and we misunderstand our role in the world around us. Sorry. Please join me in the assurance of God's grace and love. Rejoice and be glad. God is gracious and offers blessings, calling us to new life, offering us the chance to explore again how to live God's vision. We are called, we are forgiven, we are blessed to be a blessing. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 761. It's not in there? Oh, it's not in there. Let's sing, okay, it's not 761 in the purple book. But it is up here, I think. Yeah, it will be up here. I will hide your word inside my heart. Hosanna, the people cried out. Hoshana, save us now. They pin their hopes on this teacher, this prophet from Nazareth, this one who was riding on a donkey, this one who had shown compassion to them, this one who had offered a healing touch to them, this one who had called them blessed and who had taught and talked about the kingdom of God and their place in it. Hoshana, save us now, they cried. From what? From who? For what? And for who? What did they expect? I was listening to a podcast last week that was talking about how many of us grow up with the expectation that when we're hurt or when someone has offended us, wronged us, that someone else will fix it for us. You know, maybe it will be a parent or a big brother or a big sister or a teacher. Someone will come to our rescue. Someone will make it right. What happens when we carry that mindset into our adulthood. The expectation that someone else who is bigger or stronger or more powerful than we understand ourselves to be, someone who is, has more resources or more connections or has greater authority than we do, will fight the fight for us. Paves the way for other people to see themselves as a fixer, a defender, a savior. And 
to see other people as weaker, less capable, less equipped, dependent, and in need of saving. This power dynamic shows up in marriages, shows up in churches, shows up in families and communities, it shows up in religion and in politics, it shows up everywhere and anywhere. It is hierarchical by nature, and often it is patriarchal. It is the foundation of empire, the need for a strong man to protect the people to conquer that which threatens children, to overthrow that which poses a risk to a way of life, to defeat the enemy. It's seductive, both for the ones who believe that they are appointed, elected, maybe even anointed into the role of savior, and for those who live in fear. And because it's seductive, it can be exploitative, manipulative. Hosanna, the people cried out as they laid their coats and branches in the road. Hosanna, save us now, Jesus of Nazareth, God's anointed. What kind of savior is he? And what kind of God chose him for that role? Who is he fighting for? Who is he willing to die for? And how will he fight? What is his way of life? What do they expect? for him to do. What do we expect from him, even now, 2,000 years later? Theologian John Douglas Hall asks, where deity is concerned, is our foundational assumption that of power or that of love? When we think God, do we think the last word in sheer might, authority, supremacy, potency? Or do we think compassion, mercy, identification, grace, benevolence, agape? Think of it this way. Do we associate God with power or do we associate God with love? Do we associate God with victory or do we associate God with suffering? Do we associate God with triumph and glory? Or do we associate God with the cross? A classmate of mine erupted in a theology class over questions like these. Her beloved sister had recently died after suffering a long and painful illness. I don't need a God of suffering, she said. I need a God who takes away the sting of death altogether. I don't need a God who understands my pain. I need a God who takes it away. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, man's religiosity makes him look in his distress to the power of God in the world. And the Bible directs man to God's powerlessness and suffering. And from the depths of Bonhoeffer's own suffering, he wrote, only the suffering God can help. There will always be those who will puff up their chests and offer themselves as a kind of, the kind of savior or golden calf that they want the people to believe they need while Jesus offers himself and the salvation of his love. The earliest followers of Jesus called themselves the way, 
They formed a community that was centered on the love of Jesus, the love the Greeks call agape. They learned it from Jesus. Last week, we sang an anthem, and we've sung it as a hymn before. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And indeed, that earliest church, the people around them in the community, they knew they were people of the way by the way they loved. It was real. Now, they didn't always get it right, but they held each other to a high standard of mutual servanthood, honor, and truth, and peace. One of the earliest Christian preachers, John Chrysostom, said, this is the rule of most perfect Christianity, its most exact definition, its highest point, namely, the seeking of the common good. For nothing can so make a person an imitator of Christ as caring for his neighbors. They were saved by a way, a truth, and a life that honored each and every one of them as vital, just as vital, as valuable, as cherished, and as indispensable to God and to one another as any other person. They understood this way as God's dream, God's plan to save the world. And Jesus commissioned them to go to the ends of the earth and teach this way, and they taught it and they lived it throughout the Roman Empire. And we can read about how this early group of followers of the way of Jesus did it together as we read in the letters from Paul to the early churches. Paul was one of the early followers of the way after he was one of its greatest crit critics and persecutors, and he converted to it. Every time a power struggle erupted in one of these early churches, Paul sent off a letter reminding them you come back to Jesus. Come back to agape, the love of Jesus. So to the church of Corinth, he wrote, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love, which is agape, never ends. This is a common text that I preach in weddings, in memorials. It was in our wedding. But actually, it was written by Paul to the church to call them back to Jesus, to call them back to love, to the church for the world. And to the Christians in Rome, Paul wrote similar words. We heard the youth give them to us this morning. Let love be genuine, real, unhypocritical, without hidden agenda. So over the last several weeks here in worship, we have been exploring this kind of love, this agape love in lots of different ways the character the essence of god what is embodied in jesus and sent out in his followers and today it was summed up in 20 sentences out of romans chapter 12. that letter was written about 20 years after his death at that point these people of the way were a minority sect in the heart of the empire but they didn't have 24 hour a day, seven day a week news cycle to constantly distract them. But they lived in the heart of Rome and they didn't need cable news to tell them what was going on. How do we live faithfully in the midst of this? Live an ethic of love, Paul said. And using very strong language, he goes on to describe what this looks like. Abhor, detest evil. Evil, all that causes pain and misery, mean-spiritedness, 
maliciousness, abhor it. Glue yourselves, glue yourselves to all that is intrinsically good and pure and fruitful and whole. Be a leader in the way you honor and you value others. Be enthusiastically diligent in passionate, spirit-filled service. Lean into hope. Not just hope. Lean into hope. Stay grounded in times of trial. Steadfastly pray. Give of yourselves generously to the needs of those in your faith family. Open your heart to strangers. Bless everybody who seeks to do you harm. Share in each other's joys and heartaches. Be of the same mind and heart as Christ. Keep company with the humble. Don't think of yourselves more highly. Don't overinflate your IQ in your own mind. Resist retribution and vengeance, and instead choose to act in a way that everybody who views it will, views it, uh, will view it as noble. And then, this final summation, as much as it is within your control, seek peace, wholeness, well-being for all. That's it. That's it. That's the way forward. That's the way of salvation, the way of truth, dignity, and love, lived in community, lived out for the world. While Dietrich Bonhoeffer taught in an underground seminary in Germany in 1939. He wrote the book, Life Together. And in it, he doubled down on the importance of being, of understanding yourself as a part of a Christ-centered community. How to live in love for each other and for the world. He wrote, every member serves the whole body, either to its health or to its detriment. And he wrote, he who loves his dream of community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter, even though his personal intentions may be ever so honest and earnest and sacrificial. And he wrote, I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he causes me. And he wrote, if my sinfulness appears to me to be in any way smaller or less detestable in comparison with the sins of others, I'm still not recognizing my sinfulness at all. How can I possibly serve another person in unfeigned humility if I seriously regard his sinfulness as worse than my own? If you haven't read Life Together, this is a good time to read Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It acknowledges both the absolute saving gift of agape community and our utter dependence on Christ to live it. The message is the same in 55 in Rome, in 1939 in, June, in Germany, and 2023 in the United States, in every time, in every place. Save us now, we pray to the one who saves us by teaching us and by modeling for us how to continuously save ourselves, one another in the world, in love, with love, and through love. And Jesus promises, he is with us always and in all ways to the end of the age. So stay focused, stay grounded, stay faithful, stay hopeful, Stay in community. As Bonhoeffer reminds us, we are members of a body not only when we choose to be, but in our whole existence. We are the body of Christ. Blessed, broken, and given that all may be whole and well. As we get ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, I invite you to turn to hymn number 530, and let's sing this hymn as, as a way to prepare our hearts to come to the table together. 530, we'll remain seated as we sing.
come to the table of grace. Come to the table of peace. Come to the table of love. Come to the table of joy. Come to the table, this table. Come one, come all, for it has been set with love for you, for me, for all of us. I invite you to join me in prayer, and I will be lifting the words from a communion liturgy posted on the site in fleshed liturgies this morning for us as we pray together. Tender one, you hold all the world's grief close. With every word that cuts, every policy that demeans, Every act of violence or corruption, you draw near to the ones who ache. You comfort the brokenhearted and shore up beside the afflicted. We know it's not enough only to weep, but your compassion reminds us we cannot mend the world without bearing witness to its sorrow. Keep us from despair that overcomes. But never let us become strangers to the world's ache, turning away from the pain of our neighbor or growing accustomed to violence that shouldn't be. Whatever evil may befall us, whatever destruction we may witness, may we never grow cold to love or be convinced of the inevitability of cruelty. Jesus, ever present to the pain around him, did not escape into the safety of indifference, even in the shadow of the cross. His care for the suffering and his confidence in your liberating ways made him kind, softened him to even the hardest hearts, and kindled in him your love for humanity. Love that appears foolish. Love that resists evil. Love that makes way for the kingdom. So may it be so among us, O oh God, and lead us in the ways of compassion. And now pour out your spirit upon us, O oh God, and upon these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine, that the bread and the cup we share may strengthen us and nourish us for the journey to which you call each one of us, and all of us together. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Abba, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we come to this table, this is the family table, and when we remember Christ in this way with bread and with the cup, we remember Jesus at so many different meals in his life and ministry. We remember who surrounded him at those meals and how he sought to see them, each one, to listen to them, to honor them at the table, or to critique the way they failed to honor the others that were at the table. And so today, as we come to the table, we remember not only that last supper, but every supper. Jesus found himself present, loving each one. As host of that meal, however, that last supper meal that he gathered together with his friends in the upper room, he, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he offered it to his friends, his disciples, his students, those he now called friends, and he said, this bread is my body broken and given for you. Take, eat, and remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup. 
And he said, this cup is the new covenant promise sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. We say these words every time we come to the table. But for those first hearers of those words, imagine my body broken, my blood shed. What will these next hours bring? Where will this journey lead? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite the servers to come forward. And if you would be so kind as to come around this lovely carpet of greens. We do have gluten-free bread. That is cut in big pieces so that you can hold it at one end and dip it into the cup, a common cup with the other. And then if you turn to either side, there is a, a bowl of juice for you. So as you come forward, I invite you to take a piece of the bread, turn to either side, dip it into the cup, and then return to your seats. Let them get no, no. Let them get down before you start, please, and be set there. Also, while we're taking this moment for them to come back to the center, if you have a prayer concern you'd like lifted up by the community this week, there are prayer cards in front of you, in the pew in front of you, in the pew rack. Please print it out legibly if you could, and we'll put it into the newsletter for prayer for this week.
Please join me in prayer. For this church, for these people, and for our life together, we give you thanks and we call upon your saving love to bind us together in heart and mind and soul to the one who embodied your love, Jesus. Send us into your world to love it well. In your name we pray. Amen. As we come into a time of offering, uh, this is a time of offering the gifts of our hands, of our hearts, of our work, and of our song. And so we'll offer a gift of music as well for the choir. We are singing something that is found in the hymnal. So if you want to uh, read the words we're singing, you're welcome to turn to hymn number 69 or listen. The words are in both places, from our lips and in the hymnal.
Please join me in prayer. These gifts we bring are but a token of the gratitude that we feel for the way in which you fill our lives with love and call us to lives of purpose lived out in community. And so, oh God, we offer you not only the tokens, but we offer you our lives as well. In service to you, in humble service to our siblings, our neighbors, strangers, as you call us, as you strengthen us, as you give us courage. In Christ we pray, amen. A reminder that next week is Easter. Just want to talk about a couple of the things going on between now and then. We have been sending this out in newsletters, but just so that you keep this in mind as well. Thursday night, right here, 7 p.m., we'll be gathering, commemorating Jesus and his disciples in the upper room. That service is a special service every year. We have Teze music, beautiful reflective music, prayers, readings from the Gospel of John. We have a choral anthem. There is an invitation to foot washing or hand washing. And there is, of course, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. It's a beautiful service. We invite you to come to that 7 p.m. right here. Friday, Good Friday. It's going to be at the Methodist Church this year. It's a community worship service. The three pastors, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, will be leading that worship service. It is patterned after the Stations of the Cross using the artwork of Janet McKenzie, an artist in Vermont, along with readings and prayers. So I invite you to that at noon on Friday, if you can come to that. Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, there's a special activity for children and families at the church that Sam is putting together. Some of us will be there as well, telling the Easter story. I understand there's going to be an Easter egg hunt, assuming that the weather allows for that outside and inside. If the weather doesn't allow for that, we'll be telling the story of that first Easter morning in a variety of ways. And there are crafts and arts and games for that as well. 10 o'clock Saturday morning. Sunday morning, 7 a.m. is a Zoom worship service opportunity to come to watch the sunrise together. So I invite you to come on Zoom to that. We're not in person for that, but wherever you are, wherever you can see the sunrise, to call in for that service at 7 a.m. And the Zoom link will be provided to you as well as Craig sends this out to you. In that service, I invite you to bring a poem or a reading something about hope, something about resurrection, new birth, joy. We share those together along with a reading from the gospel. And we just have some moments of silence punctuated in there as well as we listen to the sounds around us. 7 a.m. 10.30, we're right back here for the celebration as a whole family of faith of the resurrection of Jesus. So that's what's coming. On Easter Sunday, you are invited to bring a potted flower and it is to be an exchange so nothing's going to be remaining here nothing's going into the grounds here but you bring a pot you take a pot and you can take home the one you brought if it fits your landscaping scheme in your home or take something that somebody else brought but we're going to bring in and decorate this whole area up here with joy and color and flowers with a pot luck and a flower pot exchange that's for the 10 30 service on easter sunday Next week, also, we are dedicating the One Great Hour of Sharing offering that's been going on through the season of Lent. There are envelopes that look like this. There are fish banks that look like this. Uh, and this is for, you make it into a bank and you can put change in it, change for the world, right? And you can put a check or cash in this. And we will be collecting and dedicating that offering next Sunday, Easter Sunday. Are there any other announcements for the good of the whole? Okay, I want to give a call to discipleship, and then we will sing as our charge and blessing, hymn number 543, the one we've been singing throughout Lent, God be the love to search and keep me. 
The call to discipleship comes from Romans chapter 12, just from the first two chapters. We didn't, or two verses. We didn't read this part this morning. This is from the message. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you will be changed from the inside out. And so let's stand in body or spirit, sing hymn number 543 as a charge and a blessing to each other. And a reminder, we have the new member class after worship this morning, just outside the gathering space. Join us please uh, for that. 543, God be the love to search and keep me. I invite you to have a seat and listen to the postlude. And immediately following the postlude, I'll be going out and joining together with the new member class, and I'm leaving my husband with this. <laughs> because this was my great idea of creating this lovely thing, and it now needs to leave. And um, so uh, we actually do have the option of taking it out into the dumpster out here, and they'll pick it up for us. So if you are so willing to help my sweet husband roll this up and take it out, I know that he would be grateful for your help. Let's listen to Phil. <laughs> 